now. So for those of you who don't know me, my name's Anne Rolfe. I've got a background in adult learning and career development. And over the last 20 years, I've been involved in mentoring programs. And my slides should be just coming up for you now. So there we are. Okay, so you can see me there. That's a nice picture. I like that one. Um, but over the last 20 years, I've been involved in mentoring programs that have kept people safe on building sites, supported sustainable and successful small businesses, retained and developed apprentices, onboarded graduates and developed future leaders, helped keep our skies safe, and award-winning programs for Aboriginal people. I've worked previously with APNA and Medicare locals and with primary care nurses and nurse executives in presenting mentoring workshops and also doing some research in those areas. So that's me. Let's um, find out a bit about you. Um, okay, I see someone can't hear, so just bear with me for a moment. I'm going to find out something about you by launching a poll. Now, this poll allows you to respond to the question whether you're working in general practice, other primary health care or in another area. And while you're filling that in, I'm going to see if I can help this person who can't hear. Just trying to help the person who uh, can't hear uh, just while you're responding to that poll. Okay, so um, looks like pretty much everyone has voted. So I'm going to close that poll and I'll share the results with you. So coming up on your screen, we can see that we have 50% of our um, participants tonight are actually in general practice, 21% in other primary health care and 29% in other. And I'll just read some of those. Um, Okay, so we have uh, Christine in Aero Medical, um, Julie's in a Medicare local, Amanda works in the university department as a researcher. Um, okay, um, Tracy, Mental Health Hospital and Community and Donna, education role in a hospital. So thanks for sharing that. It's good to know who else is on the line and you can see um, mainly general practice and other primary health care, but about a third doing other things. So let's put that away now and continue on with our slides. So in the webinar tonight, uh, we're actually going to be talking about the many ways to mentor the dynamics of a mentoring relationship, mentoring roles, and the four questions that make mentoring work. And at the end, there's an evaluation survey just as you're leaving the webinar, which will ask you to indicate um, if you've achieved these learning objectives. So you'll leave the webinar with a framework that will enable you to enjoy mentoring conversations more often and even more effectively. 
We did some research last year and some of the reasons nurses have informal or formal mentorings, men, mentors sorry, are to discuss issues and challenges. To have someone who's a sounding board for their ideas and um, it's useful and helpful to receive confidence building feedback. And I'd like you to put your hand up if you've had this kind of relationship at work or indeed in life. And you can type in a comment if you wish. So um, just put your hand up if you've had a relationship, informal or formal. Okay, I'm, a, I'm seeing Amanda's hand going up there. Carolyn, Cheryl, Anne. Christine, another Christine, Donna, Janine, lots of hands going up. Julie, Kim, Marion, Rachel, Suzanne, Terry, Tracy. So quite a lot. Um, probably about half of you are saying, yes, you've had this kind of relationship previously. Um, and feel free to type in a comment about that if you wish to. It might have been formal. It might have been informal, it might have been part of your career, or it might have been part of your personal life. But most people these days, when they reflect, can think about a uh, conversation or a relationship that could be labelled as a mentoring conversation or relationship. And mentoring takes all forms these days. Um, there are many ways to mentor. And some of the ways that I've observed is informal and probably informal mentoring is still the most frequent form. And indeed, Amanda is saying all of her mentors have been informal. Thanks for sharing that, Amanda. So informal mentoring is still the most common form and it might be a one-off conversation or it might be an ongoing, indeed a lifelong relationship for some people. Then we have formal mentoring, so uh, conversations that happen as part of a structured program. And what I mean by a structured program is um, someone has put together a way of uh, matching people or at least putting people in touch, linking them to each other, and provided some sort of objectives for the uh, purpose for the mentoring and also um, some support mechanisms in a formal mentoring program. But other ways to mentor include reciprocal mentoring. And again, this could be formal or it could be informal. I don't know about you, but I have a bunch of colleagues and close friends uh, business friends really and it might be me tonight ringing a friend ringing a colleague saying hey um, I'm having a difficult time with this or do you know anything about that and they will perhaps give me some advice or some guidance but next week it will be them ringing me or sending me an email or um, having coffee and picking my brain and asking about my experience in some particular area so reciprocal relation mental relationships with colleagues, people you know, inside your field or perhaps outside of it as well. Reverse mentoring is popular in some organisations. This is where perhaps senior people in an organisation might be linked with a younger person, someone who's a bit tech savvy, someone who knows about social media and the, the uh, correct use of, of social media and so a senior person less experienced in those you know newer technologies is able to link up with someone who's grown up with it quite tech savvy. Cascading mentoring in some organizations we have senior people mentoring the next level down and they mentor the next level down and so on and so forth. And I see Terry is saying, my mentors are from other professions. And this is commonly the case, Terry, very useful. Um, but Terry's saying, we have a common interest in mental health. Health. This is over, over Facebook messages mostly. And again, this is a very uh, positive use of social media. And I don't know how many of you know you can set up a, a private group, even a secret group, or you can have open groups on um, on Facebook that are dedicated to a particular topic. And Terry has uh, a group that she meets with online on Facebook um, around their common interest in mental health. 
Okay, um, group mentoring, and, and Terry's example was an example of that. I'm a member of several groups, um, online and offline. I have a meeting this Wednesday night where I'll team up with a group of business friends, and we do this regularly um, to talk about business and the latest things we're doing and the latest topics and hot topics. Okay, Donna's saying... Um, Oh, this is a question. In an informal activity, do both parties have to agree it was a mentoring conversation? Often hear people say they were mentoring someone, but the someone doesn't seem to know this. Yes, and it can be uh, sort of a uh, almost um, one person has an agenda, the other one doesn't. It's quite informal. And we'll talk, you'll see one of the examples, Donna, that I put up is called mentoring moments. And I define that as opportunistic mentoring conversations so um, along with that there's round tables so this is kind of group mentoring as well this is a situation where um, there's no particular mentor in a group mentoring situation you might have one mentor meeting with a group of people so that person the kinds they might facilitate the group they might be the go-to person on a particular topic they might be the experienced person so they might be the mentor in a round table, no one in particular is the mentor. It depends on the topic. It depends on the questions that come up. And each person is a peer, is a colleague. There's no status involved in this. And it's simply a round table discussion with anyone at the table equal and free to comment. Mentoring circles, a little bit different. They're usually facilitated. There may be one or two mentors in the circle and, and a separate facilitator as well, a for another form of group mentoring. E-mentoring are very popular. There are numerous mentoring programs that you can join online where you may never meet your mentoring partner face-to-face. -face. Everything happens online. It might be through forums, through a particular mentoring platform. It could be on Facebook or one of the other channels. I have a group mentoring relationship which um, one of my mentors uh, facilitates that using Google Plus Hangouts, which is a free video conferencing service. So e-mentoring, we do that about once a month. Um, then there's uh, a, a master mentor. So this is someone who is an expert in their field who um, I might go to, and I have several of these as well. Um, my master mentors are expert in their field and I actually pay them. It's sort of akin to consulting, but a bit more personalised, I suppose. Um, so a different form of mentoring again. Then there are those mentoring moments that I talked about. Um, the simple opportunistic conversations. And uh, one of the questions that came in before the webinar was about using mentoring in your personal life. And I guess this is an example. You might look for that moment uh, to have conversations, say, with your teenage children, with your brothers or sisters, uh, with um, other uh, friends, colleagues or family members. When the moment appears, you seize that moment and use it for a mentoring conversation, whether you are seeking their input or offering your own. And the uh, framework that I'm going to offer you tonight will show you how to make those moments even more effective. And the last one I've got there just appearing on the screen is the manager as mentor. And um, although in a mentoring program, mentors are usually offline, that is not your manager or in that uh, sort of direct line of authority, there is an increasing role for managers to play in a form of mentoring. So mentoring subordinates. It might not be um, the holistic uh, relationship that someone offline might be able to have with a person there are certainly there are things that I might talk to with a manager or with a uh, sorry there might be things I'd talk to with an offline mentor that I wouldn't necessarily want to talk to my manager about so there's kind of a line of um, distinction there it's also important for managers if they're going to be mentoring their staff to be able to be really clear when they have their manager hat on and when they have their mentor hat on because it could be a somewhat different um, conversation 
Okay. Um, Janet Wenham, I'm seeing your hand up there. I'm wondering if you have a question or a comment. If so, you might like to type that in to the question box now. Okay, thank you. I will be pausing for some questions again in just a little while. For the moment, I'm going to launch another poll. Um, Oh, well, actually, what I'm going to do is is just talk to you briefly about this. Um, there are a number of benefits, and I've talked about three so far, um, in mentoring relationships and networks. Um, but one of the ones that is apparent is this idea of reducing isolation. And sometimes it can feel like you're the only one out there. And that's why we have support networks and support groups. So I'm just going to come out and, and ask you the question. And, and this is in the form of a poll, so it's completely anonymous. And I'm keeping it really simple. So the question is, do you ever feel isolated, alone, or lacking opportunities for support from other nurses in your work situation? And um, you've got uh, a choice. You can only choose one in this particular poll. I'm seeing those votes coming in now. We've got about 40% of the votes. Okay, just waiting while those votes come in. Good. I think that perhaps uh, looks like we've got 92% have voted on this one. So I'm just going to close that and share that with you. This will be quite interesting. Okay. So unfortunately, 20%, and we've got uh, 40 people on the line um, this evening, so it's a decent sample, and 20% regularly feel isolated, alone, or lacking in opportunities for support from other nurses in their work situation. 57% sometimes feel that way. Uh, if you want to make a comment, please type it in. I'll keep this one anonymous, okay? So I won't read names. You can simply type in if you've got a comment to make. Excellent news. The 17% rarely feel that way and 6% never feel that way. So um, a bit of a mixed bag there, but quite a large percent. So if you add the 57 and the 20, that's 77%. That's um, more than two-thirds, that's nearly eight in ten people. Okay, so I'm going to read out this comment. I'll keep it anonymous. Okay, so this person says, always feel that way in a new job. Yeah, that's pretty sad, isn't it? I wonder, I wonder what other people's experience is. It can be lonely when you start a new job, and that's the very time when it would be useful to make people feel welcome and part of the team. Okay, so I'm going to continue on. If you've got other comments, uh, feel free. Okay, um, this one is an, I'm going to keep anonymous too. Um, I have a lot of potential support, but sometimes feel it's too close to my work to ask for the help. And it's often informal, so you don't want to feel like being a nuisance. I wonder who else feels that way. And that's where it's really important to build your support networks with trusted colleagues outside of the workplace. There's always going to be confidential aspects of your work that you can't talk about and you know um, what those boundaries are. But um, it is useful if you've got trusted people. And, and also I think it's important not always to be taking that home. You know, um, uh, if you've got people at home, you know, partners or close people at home that you can share things with, you don't want to overuse that because you can wear out your welcome. So having professional colleagues um, that you can talk to. Okay, I'm going to keep this next comment anonymous as, or, as well. We have a non-clinical management which can make it very difficult. Yeah, I can understand that. There's always that sense of um, when you talk to another professional in your field, um, then 
you have that rapport. You believe that they can understand you more closely and it can be easy to think that non-clinical management wouldn't understand and you may be quite right with that. So, yeah, it just adds to my commitment that we need to be building our professional relationships. Okay, someone else is saying, felt that way frequently as our manager has minimal medical expertise. Oh, there's comments are coming in now. Um, someone else. So you're not alone there, that person who said, um, because this person is a different person is saying, I also have the non-clinical manager problem. Okay, so I'm going to move on now, but you can keep those comments if your fingers are hovering over the over the uh, keyboard. Um, uh, please uh, continue to type in. I'm going to continue on. Now I'll come back to these comments a little bit later and your questions too. For now, I want to talk about what mentoring actually is. And um, if you've ever had one of those light bulb moments, those aha moments, um, those flashes of insight and sometimes it is kind of sudden maybe you've seen someone else having an aha moment and I reckon that sometimes you can almost see the light bulb going on above their head and I've been interested to to uh, discover that uh, some of the um, neuroscientists are now uh, finding out and doing studies and they've put people inside one of those functional MRIs you know where where they do the brain scan and they've and I have no idea how they managed to do this, but they've seen when someone has that flash of insight, there are parts of the brain that actually light up with energy. It lasts for a full four seconds. And I don't know about you, but I can really relate to having one of those bright ideas. The answer, the solution came to me, perhaps in the early hours of the morning or perhaps when I was in the shower, or perhaps when I was driving my car. And my answer disappears. My great flash of brainwave just disappears. And that's because it can last four seconds unless you do something to actually capture that insight. And that's why one of the definitions I use for mentoring is actually conversations that create insight. And as you'll know, um, you can have conversations that create insight informally, socially, at work, with colleagues, with friends, even with strangers. If you've been to a conference or a seminar or a workshop and maybe in the tea break you've just started a conversation with someone else who's participating, discussing what, uh, what's been presented, and sometimes getting their point of view actually gives you one of those flashes of insight um, that you had. And sometimes because you're having the conversation, you can actually capture that. So um, you can have it quite casually and you can have deliberately designed group or one-to-one -one mentoring relationships. I want you to understand that mentoring is not a training relationship. It's not preceptorship. It's not supervision. It's a more often a holistic relationship. It's a conversation. And it's a conversation that actually allows you to predict the future, not by gazing into a crystal ball. Indeed, by having conversations about possibilities, alternatives, weighing them up and making choices, informed decisions about what you'll do next in order to create the future that you want. The picture that's coming up on your screen now, there it is. Um, I'd love to be able to Photoshop this one because I often think that we look in the mirror, we don't see the powerful, courageous, strong person that we might be. And sometimes we need someone else to reflect back to us what they see in us. And you might put your hand up if you've ever had that kind of really positive feedback from someone. Now, not just anyone. It needs to be someone who's credible so you can believe in what they're saying, someone you respect and someone um, who 
has good intentions. So they're not just buttering you up or flattering you for some reason. They're giving you positive feedback with good intentions for you. And I see Anne's got her hand up. Carolyn has her hand up. Cheryl has her hand up. This is great to see. Because when you get this sort of powerful, and Julie also, and Marion and Morag and Suzanne, you've had people in your lives who've given you this positive feedback and that's so useful because when you get that kind of positive feedback from someone who's credible, someone you respect and someone who has good intention, it not only builds your self-esteem, it often also believe, uh, raises your performance because I don't know about you, but I go, if someone gives me real positive feedback, I go, oh, well, if he thinks that or if she thinks that, I start to believe it and I lift my game to live up to their expectations. But do you know what? We also need the other kind of feedback, the kind of feedback that mightn't be that easy to hear sometimes, but someone who give us a different point of view, someone who's got a BDI, a different perspective, and again, will give us that feedback. And if, again, that's someone who's credible, someone we respect, and someone with good intention, not someone who's trying to tear us down. On the contrary, someone who is giving us feedback in order to build our capability. Then we are more likely to listen and choose what we'll do with that feedback. They say the early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. And it's so useful to hear the stories and the experience of people who've been there before us so that we don't have to make all mistakes. And when we have these kinds of conversation in a group or an individual situation, it creates a kind of synergy. I actually think that's beer they're getting out of the fridge, not cat food. But the point is an unusual combination of uh, creatures here working together to achieve something they can't do by themselves. We live very busy, very complex lives and having these kind of conversations can help make the complex simpler. It helps us to cut through all that stuff and decide what's really important. It also helps us to look at the bigger picture so that we can think strategically. It can help us examine those bright spark ideas that we sometimes have and figure out if they're really a great idea that's worth actioning or whether in fact they're a bit of a brainstorm rather than a brain wave. Mentoring is a conversation not about telling you what to do, but rather about helping you find your own direction. So I'm going to pause for a moment now and ask you um, to type in, and I know there are some other comments here, I'll read those, but, ask, but read the next ones. Can you type in, if you only had one word to describe mentoring, and there's no rights or wrongs here, if you could just use one word to describe from your point of view what mentoring is, what would that one word be? And I'm going to start reading some of those comments that came in earlier about isolation and then I'll get to your, um, your words about what is mentoring. So um, going back to isolation, this person says, I used to feel isolated but I've been part of a nurse network for over six months now that meets every six weeks. Wonderful, she says. Yes, I strongly recommend. Can you really ever truly trust colleagues? Hmm, interesting question. Be interested in some of your responses. Can you ever really trust colleagues? Okay, someone else is saying, I ask who my go-to person will be when I'm interviewing for any job and I try to set up a chatty and engaging conversation with them as soon as I start any job. What a great piece of advice. Thanks for that. Um, so in the job interview, who's my go-to person? And then starting on the front foot, setting up that um relationship from the get-go so here's another one non-clinical manager as well okay this seems to be a, a, a recurring theme uh, someone else is saying it's hard to give negative feedback yes it is okay 
uh, yes, someone turned up late. That's okay. I know how it, what it's like. Um, so here we go with the one word. So keep typing in. So Amanda is saying it's support. Carolyn's also saying support. Suzanne saying held. Okay. Um, Alison is saying leadership. Christine saying support. Rosie saying wisdom. Jane also says support. Julie says empower. Another support from Tracy. Engaging from Jen. Guidance from Terry. Uplifting says Marion. Helping says Anne. Fertilizer in the best possible way says Tracy. Growth from Donna. Support from Carol. Role model from Sarah. And support again from. Janine, companionship. So we're talking about that isolation, that loneliness, okay? Um, Catherine says practice wisdom. Excellent. Need to move along. I want to give you a framework for mentoring here. And I've used the visual metaphor of these roof trusses because if you've ever been to a new estate where lots of houses are being built, they kind of all look more or less the same in the beginning. They have foundations, solid foundations, and they have a framework. But if you go back and, and visit a new estate, you'll see as they continue to be built, they start to show their individual differences. And by the time a family moves in with their artwork, with their furniture, with their uh, possessions and their knickknacks, um, each home ends up being unique. And I'd like to suggest to you that mentoring is like that as well. No two mentoring relationships are the same. Each one is unique, but you can build yours on a solid foundation and the framework that I'm about to offer you now. So just before I go into that, though, let's have another quick poll. Um, because I'm interested to know um, how often do you actually have the opportunity to provide support to other nurses? So, so far we've talked about you getting support and the isolation and loneliness that you sometimes feel. Now I'm reversing that. So how often do you get the opportunity to provide support to other nurses? Okay, about half of you have voted. Uh, just one response to be chosen here, and they're coming in, 74% have voted now. Just before we go into the framework, how many? How often do you have this? The votes are rushing in now. We're up to 92%, which is about as far as we got last time. So I'm going to close the poll, share that with you. Excellent results here. Can you see 71%? regularly have the opportunity to provide support to other nurses. So isn't that wonderful? Okay, just looking at a comment now, and Rose is saying, Rosie is saying, we take student nurses at our practice. That's excellent. Um, so uh, someone else is saying, I think, that they often work independently so that makes it I imagine more difficult to provide support but I'm really thrilled to see that 71% regularly have the opportunity 26% sometimes and only 3% rarely and nobody never so let's put these away okay and Okay, so I want to talk about the mentoring dynamic because, as I said, each mentoring relationship is, is unique, no two are the same. And within the mentoring relationship, whether it's informal or informal, relationship itself is dynamic. What I mean by that, it, it's changing. It's not one thing all of the time. Now, we have some ideas about mentoring, some traditional ideas about mentoring. And the traditional view is that a mentor is going to impart, uh, share their knowledge and experience. And certainly that is a useful aspect of mentoring and something that mentors often do. And we often look for um, advice, information, guidance from our mentors. But I want you to clearly understand that mentoring is equally and 
and in the early stages more about asking questions and listening. So I've labelled that illicit. Um, do you ever go home from work and you've, it's one of those really tough days at work and, and if you're like me, you reach for the glass of wine, I'm, I'm going to confess, and you want to unburden yourself and so your partner or someone close walks in and he's silly enough to ask you, hi, how was your day? And you tell them. And as you're telling them, they start to tell you what you should have done, offer advice, offer suggestions or point out what you could have, should have or they would have done. What's your response to that? I don't know if I'm the only one, but I hate it. I absolutely hate it. All I wanted to do was ventilate, express myself, get it off my chest and sip my glass of wine and have someone listen to me. It's not that different. So, Amanda, I think you're, 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 you're agreeing with me. Amanda says, not impressed. Yes, that's how I feel too. Not impressed. All I wanted to do was ventilate. And quite often, and Janet's agreeing as well, um, and Catherine says, most women operate like this. Yeah, we just want to talk and be listened to, um, and, uh, and some other people don't get that. Um, but it's not just in that situation, in any situation. And you'd know this from your clinical practice as well. Remember the idea of the presenting problem and then the underlying problem. And if you don't ask questions and listen carefully and ask more questions, you may never get to that underlying, the real issue. And it's the same in mentoring. Naturally, our instinctive if is if someone comes to us asking a question, our instinct is to answer. If someone comes to us and asks advice, our instinct, our natural helpful self wants to give advice. But I'm asking you to consider holding off, asking questions, listening before you offer advice. I'll keep this comment anonymous. Um, because this person is saying, when my husband and I walk the dog in the evening, he allows me to download. Oh, I could have said who this was. As we get closer to our home, he asks me if I finished because we're nearly home. It helps. What a wonderful way to, what is it, decompress. It's like when a diver goes down too deep and they have to go in the decompression chamber before they can come to the surface and, and, and be normal again. And what a beautiful example. So I'm going to say thank you, Marion, for that piece of advice. We should do that more often and much more help, uh, healthy for us than my glass of wine. Thank you. Okay, so coming back to the mentoring dynamic, we always think of mentors, and many of you use this word to describe, um, a mentor supports you, they encourage you, they validate your experience. But I'm suggesting to you too, wouldn't you also want someone who can challenge and uh, your point of view and perhaps provide a different perspective? Now, you have to earn the right you have to build trust and rapport and that happens when you ask questions and listen without judging people and that earns you the right. So this is the dynamic I've illustrated on the screen for you. It's not an either or dichotomy. I'm suggesting to you mentoring conversations are dynamic. They move. Sometimes you'll be asking questions and listening, sometimes you will go into imparting your knowledge and wisdom. Much of the time will involve you supporting, encouraging and validating the person that you are mentoring. But sometimes once you've earned the right, once you have the trust, the rapport, so they know that your intentions for them are good, then you can jump in and challenge. You can provide a different point of view, a different perspective, because this is what opens minds. This is what gives us alternatives. This is what develops options and empowers us to make informed choices. So that's the first uh, point that I really wanted to make about mentoring. We can build on this now as we start to talk about the roles 
of mentors, and it is plural because there are many roles that a mentor can take. And I will pause for some questions again in just a moment. So the mentoring roles. Now, first and foremost, a mentor is a confidant. You can see why we need to build trust and rapport. And for the person who said, can you ever really trust your colleagues? Um, then if you can't, then you certainly don't want to be confiding in them because a confidant is someone that you can share with confident in the knowledge that that conversation will remain confidential just between the two of you. So first, that's the first um, uh, first tenant of, of mentoring, I guess, a confidant. That's the role. The next role that a mentor may play is a catalyst. And what I mean by that is that person who listens to you, the husband you go for the walk with and the dog who simply listens. I wonder how often, if like me, if you've had this person who listens, maybe asks a question or two but is largely silent, but very present for you, very aware, um, very empathetic but simply listening. And how often when you get that gift of someone who's present and merely, not merely, simply listening to you and suddenly you get that aha, you know the answer, you get the solution, you know what you need to do. That's what I mean by the catalyst. They don't have to say or do very much at all. They simply have to be there in listening mode, letting you ventilate or express yourself, and you come up with your own answers and actions. A mentor, as I mentioned before, a sounding board. You just want to run your ideas by them, try them out, and perhaps get some feedback. That feedback might be supportive or it could be quite challenging. You know someone who will say to you, I understand where you're coming from that, but in my experience, when you do X, Y tends to happen and after that, along comes Z. So it might be a supporting role and it might be a challenging role. But a sounding board is probably the one of the most common descriptions I get when I ask people about their mentors. A mentor may be a link. Now, mentors are often reassured in, in workshops when I say to them, you don't have to be... Um, you don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to be the font of all wisdom. What you can be is a link. And indeed, you shouldn't be answering every question. If you answer every question, you're building dependence. If instead you're able to point people in to other resources, to other information. And I always say to people who are going to be mentored in formal pro programs, never go to your mentor with a question that you could have found out the answer to elsewhere. Instead, go to them with your question or your issue, go to them with the information you found of doubt and ask them about their real life lived experience of this issue so that you you know you're using them as the resource that they can be not merely mr google so if you're a mentor don't be google google's out there okay i'm seeing some comments coming in uh catherine says i like the co coffee analogy trust and rapport is either an instant is either instant or like percolated coffee takes a bit longer. What a lovely analogy. Thank you for that, Catherine. Um, okay, Catherine's also saying self-efficacy, self-management. You might want to expand on that for me, Catherine. I'm not quite sure what your comment or question is meaning. Okay, a mentor is also a role model. So, and this goes back to the question someone asked, can you be a mentor without the other person even knowing it? You are because you are a role model for the uh, student nurses, for the less experienced nurses, in fact, for everyone in your practice or in your work situation. The way you conduct yourself, the way you go about things, the way you speak positively or negatively about your practice or workplace or other people in your workplace is a role model. The way you deal 
with patients, the comments you make about patients after they leave, your modelling behaviours and attitudes that will be picked up. A mentor can also be a coach and the distinction I make is um, mentoring is more about conversations, about listening, about um, asking and about offering advice, opinions and uh, alternatives. A coach is closer to a teaching model, closer to a preceptor role, where it's actually about behaviour and performance. You might model the behaviour, but you might also um, verbalise the lesson, kind of a show and tell. You might then observe the performance of the person in the workplace or in that role and then give them feedback on their performance, coaching them until they achieve the required standards. So sometimes there's a role for coaching within mentoring. Certainly a mentor is an advisor. As I mentioned before, you want to hold back on the advice. Even when people ask your advice, my recommendation is that you ask questions, listen, try to get the issues behind the questions before you start um, imparting your wisdom and your experience. And finally, when you combine the sorts of things I've talked about so far, the elicit as well as impart, the support as well as challenge, you truly are a guide, not in the sense of telling people what to do, but in the sense of enabling people to figure out what they need to do. So um, I'm going to pause and check out the questions and comments that have been coming in. Um, you can take this moment to type in some more. I think we're unfortunately going to run a little bit over time, so I'm going to go as quickly as I can. So um, Janet's saying she also has student nurses. Catherine is saying, saying it's a collaborative. So this is the description of mentoring, the collaborative relationship. Oh, that may be what um, what Catherine's comment was. Yes, okay, Catherine, thank you. So a mentor, build self-efficacy and self-management. Okay, Marion's saying need to be a role model for our patients as well. Definitely you do. It's very difficult to take advice um, from someone when you're looking at that person and they don't appear to be walking their talk, okay? Okay. Um, uh, Catherine saying, as a mentor, we want our novice nurses to become self-sufficient. As you mentioned, we are, uh, we are, and we act as a resource. Okay, so if you have more questions or comments, please type them in. I'll pause for those in just a moment. So, um, mentoring. I guess you're seeing mentoring is something that enables people to set and achieve their own goals. It's something that allows people to explore problems and issues and it is something that enables effective and informed decision making. Just looking for this question. Okay. Oh, this is a wonderful comment from Julie. Julie saying, as a mentor, I often learn from the mentees. And I agree with you, Julie. My experience is every time I talk to a group of mentors, there will be a majority of them who will say, I learn as much as the people I mentor from our conversations and relationships. And Catherine's saying, we need to hold our own set of values. Yes, you do. And they will they will be modelled. They will show what your values are in your conversations and relationships and your role modelling. Okay, so in the last segment, I'm going to provide the final model of a mentoring conversation. But before we do that, I have one more poll. And again, this is a fairly direct question. Um, and I'm wanting to know, um, do you have access to another nurse with whom you could discuss a clinical problem, a professional issue? So I'm being more specific this time, a workplace issue, or and this is a bit different, I hope it can sort of fit, and you can choose more than one for this, for this poll. So feel free to choose one, two, three, or all four. Um, 
Perhaps other people seek you out to discuss clinical problems, professional issues or workplace issues. I'm suspecting we'll have a lot of that given the response to the earlier question. So 64% have voted now, 69, 72, 74%, 79%, they're rolling in, 85%, okay, 87%, this is taking a little bit longer because you can choose more than one here, okay, I think I'm going to stop now because we need to move on quickly. Okay, so I'm closing that. I'm going to share the results. Well, now obviously these add up to much more than 100% because you could choose more than one. So it's good to know that most of you do have another nurse you can turn to when you need to discuss a clinical problem a professional issue or even a workplace issue. And the vast majority of you out there, and we've got 40 there on the line tonight, uh, you are people that others seek out to discuss these issues. Okay, so let me put that away. Okay. Um, and I'll keep this one anonymous because the person is saying, yes, this happens out, outside from work, though. Yes. And um, I guess those clinical and professional, well, the clinical issues, obviously you need it to be another nurse or a healthcare professional appropriately. Um, some professional issues and some workplace issues you could discuss um, you'd have to be wary of the confidentiality as aspects of those, though. But, um, yeah, I would say uh, my recommendation is build your networks within your profession and outside of your profession. So let's go to this last model, and this is the most useful model of the mentoring conversation. If you are mentoring others and you've ever thought to yourself, what do I do now, what do I say next, this model means you need never think that again. You will know what to say, what to do next. And so this is what allows you to have even more effective mentoring conversation. This is the model that allows you to capitalise um, on those mentoring moments, to take the opportunities that just present themselves and know what to say and do and jump in there. So the mentoring conversation essentially has four parts. The first part is where you, have, you are building the trust and the rapport and you are asking questions that get people to reflect on their own experience. And, of course, nurses um, and the reflective learning model that you approach, and, in fact, this model is built on action learning, the learning cycle. You'll be really familiar with it. I've simply plopped it into the context of mentoring, and I've been using this for years and years, and it's, I found it to be extremely useful. So the first part, reflecting on experience. The second part, the reason you want them to reflect on experience is so you can take the next step and enable them to make informed decisions about, in the third area, the actions they will take or perhaps actions they'll stop doing or do differently in order to produce a better outcome. And, of course, when you change your actions, you create a whole new experience. Okay, question from Rachel. Uh, will this be available to listen to later? I've only come uh, from Queensland. Okay. Yes, Rachel, we are recording the webinar and it will be available. You'll get an email soon uh, giving you the link to that. So don't worry, you'll be able to go. And even if you've been here the whole time, you may want to listen again and watch again to these, uh, to these ideas. So um, I mentioned at the beginning there are four questions that are the foundation of your mentoring uh, conversation. And the questions are these. Question number one, as you get people, and I should say, these are not the words you would actually use. These are the questions you hold in your mind so that you frame appropriate questions. So if you can remember three of these four questions, that's all you need to do at any one time. You'll never need more than three at the one time. Um, if you can remember these, you'll never have to worry about what do I say or do next because they'll help you frame a question, a conversation starter. 
So question number one is where are you now? So it's basically like strategic planning. You know, your starting point is where are you now? What's going on for you now? What's the current situation? Um, what's going on for you now? What's the problem? What's the issue? What's the question on your mind? So some variation of where are you now is what you're trying to find out. And you frame questions that get people to reflect on their experience so that they can make informed decisions. So if question number one is where are you now, what would you guess question number two might be? We're getting a bit late, so I'll make it a rhetorical question and tell you the answer or my answer at least. Question number two, where do you want to be? Again, not the words you might use, but the idea you keep in your mind as you frame up questions. So it's um, where do you want to be? What's the outcome you're really after? What's your goal here? How would you like this situation? What's your vision? Well, in an ideal world, how would this play out for you? So then question number three, you're probably able to guess this because we're moving towards action. Question number one is where are you now? Question number two, where do you want to be? Question number three, how might you get there? And I've used the word might here very um, um uh, very deliberately, how might you get there? Um, now, your question will be a variation on this theme, but I want you to keep in mind the word might because very often when people have problems and we're guiding them through a problem-solving process or they have a decision to make and we're guiding them through a decision-making process, if we said how how would you get there or how could you get there, they might jump in with a solution and they might stop. And very often we know in problem solving people come up with the answer when what we want them to come up with is a range of possibilities, alternatives, because that's what empowers them. The more possible answers they have, possible solutions, ideas, pathways, the more choices they have and the better, the more likely they are to make an informed decision. And I might have confused you because I talked about three questions and four questions. There is a fourth question, but you only need to keep these three in your mind at any one time. It, it's possible that you might have a conversation and only use one of these questions, but the most you'll ever use in one session will be the three because question number four is something you'll do as a follow-up. You'll get them in the first part of these or early conversations, get them to figure out what they want and how they might get there. So setting goals, thinking about actions, making a bit of a plan. Then they need to go away and do something and you follow up later on with a fourth question which is along the lines of how are you doing? What did you do? How did that work out for you? Um, what happened? Okay, so Catherine's saying this is a menu. Yes, it is a menu. Um, choose your own adventure. Sarah's saying uh, seems quite similar to healthy coaching. Of course it is. Mentoring and coaching are very, very similar, although some people will tell you and argue about the distinctions. In fact, in my opinion, they have more similarities than difference. Um, Marion, it's so similar to motivation. It is, Marion, very similar. So if you look at the literature on motivational interviewing, you'll find the crossovers there. And, um, and you can use the models that work for you. I just find this a very simple and useful one. So let me pause again briefly and see if there are more questions or comments coming in. We're going to have to wrap this up now because I'm seeing that we've gone a little over time. Thank you for staying with me um, and I will continue and answer your questions as long as you want to uh, hang around. Um, so I'm just pausing briefly before I kind of do the wrap-up bit and if you have to go, you have to go, but I will stay and answer questions. Um, so Terry is saying, how are you doing could also be, what did you learn? 
definitely because this uh, that model is actually a learning cycle so it's ongoing it can be a continuous rotation you can jump from one quadrant to another as you need to even though I sort of said it's a one two three four model um, you can feel free and in a natural flying conversation you mil will move from one point to the other so thanks for that Terry any other questions or comments you want to type in I'm going to come back in a minute um, and I will stay as long as um, you need to ask questions or make comments. For now, I just want to provide a summary because we've covered quite a bit of ground. The main points I want you to take from this, I talked about many uh, varied ways to mentor. So we're not stuck in it's just informal or formal, it's just one-on-one. -on -one. There are many different ways. Our definition of mentoring is very broad these days. In fact, I went to an international mentoring conference last year in the States where one academic had done a whole lot of research and found 500 different definitions of mentoring. So there is no one uh, single definition of mentoring. So there are many ways to do it and many styles and formats. I want you to take away this idea of the dynamic uh, relationship of mentoring. It is the traditional aspect of sharing your knowledge and your experience, imparting your wisdom, but equally and, and I believe even more importantly, it's also about eliciting from the person, asking questions, listening to them, being present and allowing them whenever possible to explore and find their own solutions and not building dependence on you. It is also about very much about support and we all need um, our support networks where we get encouragement and validation from our peers, from our mentors, uh, from our colleagues. And once we've earned the right, the dynamic is also to challenge, to provide a different perspective, to offer our opinions, even though they may be different, to own them as our opinions, um, but, uh, but also to provide that perspective. Then I talked about the various mentoring roles. So I hope this is expanding your ideas and possibilities for mentoring. And finally, the model of the mentoring conversation, which is very similar to other models that are out there. Um, so feel free if you want to use a different model, but this one I hope will give you an opportunity to make the most of mentoring moments and opportunities. So um, as we come to the end, I've got a final quote for you, uh, which I think is just quite lovely because many of you are mentoring other people and I think that's just wonderful. But I like this quote, you cannot hold a torch to light another's path without also illuminating your own. So before you go, I would like you to give some feedback. Um, there will be an evaluation survey as you depart, but before you depart, um, you might like to list your key takeaways. What are the points you're taking out of this time we've spent online tonight? And in particular, what actions will you take as a result? They say knowledge is power, but to me, it's what you do with knowledge that's really powerful. So type in, I'm going to uh, go back to the questions, the comments uh, that are coming in now. Um, uh, so Christine... Okay, thanks, Christine. Um, Janet says you could apply this to applying for a new job. Yes, you could. I used this model before I developed it in the mentoring context. I used it in career planning because it's exactly what you do when you're thinking about your career, when you're planning your future. Where am I now? Where do I want to be? Um, you think about the values and, and the personal preferences and the things that are dear to you in planning your future direction before you start to think about well, how might I get there? Okay, uh, Catherine is saying, are there further professional development opportunities to further develop mentoring knowledge and skills? Yes, this is a first in a series of four webinars. You'll be receiving information about the follow-up webinars um, as we go forward. Um, I gathered questions 
for from you in the registration process. So we'll be going through those, plus what's come out of this evening's webinar to develop the third and fourth. We have our second webinar mapped out and uh, they're, they're all scheduled, so there will be. And, of course, the idea is that you use these and join your peer-led networks in your area or start one with support from APNA so that you can develop your mentoring skills and use them to support your colleagues and um, and yourself. Okay, um, Amanda saying, any similar questions to the four questions that you should, could ask as the mentee? Um, <clears throat> uh, yes, Amanda, I think there's scope to kind of turn those questions around. Um, and um, you can sort of, um, my philosophy is if you are being mentored, it's always really helpful for you to generate an agenda for your mentor. So it's kind of going, even though it might still be an informal mentoring relationship, but it could also be um, uh, have a little bit of structure if you give your mentor a heads up. So I want to come to you tonight and I want to talk about where I am and what's going on for me and what's important in my life because I want to plan my next steps and how I might get there. So you can kind of give this this model to your mentor um, to cue them in terms of what you actually want from them and they will find that very very helpful and it will add to this it helps mentors to feel secure if they know what you want from them. Um, Okay. Um, okay. Someone's saying I'm more used to the rigid clinical supervision or something. Um, yes. Yeah, so mentoring is much more flexible. It's not clinical supervision. Um, it is more of a conversation, a professional development or a personal development or a career development conversation. It's it's. Um, it, it, it's more free flowing and and less um, uh, less structured than your clinical supervision. Okay. Okay, I love this comment. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, Cheryl's saying, I enrolled in the webinar to find out about something I thought I didn't know much about, but in truth, I do it every day in so many ways, both privately and professionally. I'm guessing there are a lot out there, a lot of you out there who feel the same way as Cheryl, and I'm very pleased about that. Um, if this webinar reinforces what you're already doing and allows you to, to really acknowledge that for yourself and perhaps build on what you're already doing looking for more opportunities to do it that is a fantastic outcome and I'm really pleased with that so congratulations um, okay and Cheryl saying really like to get involved in a nurse network to gain support and give support that's what we want we want you to be involved so look for one contact up now see if there's one in your area if there's not start one um, I'm sure, uh, and this webinar proves there are other nurses just like you out there who want to give support and gain support as well. Um, okay, so I'm guessing this is a key takeaway from Anne. Listen and ask questions before imparting information. That's a great takeaway and one we can apply in all aspects of our work and life. Okay, Sarah's saying my key takeaway is how to use open open answered question to tease information rather than giving suggestions. Yes, those open questions, things like can you tell me a little bit more about that or say a bit more about that or questions that uh, start that, that can't be answered with a yes or a no, where, when, how. Um, be careful about asking why because people may feel the need to justify themselves and get defensive, but um, uh, there are ways to, fr to phrase why questions to reduce the defensiveness. So that's great. Okay, Jane. I would like to acknowledge and say thanks to my mentors who opportunistically provide me with mentoring without actually knowing that. I think that would be a wonderful thing. And I think if more of us actually gave that feedback, 
to our mentors, uh, it would be a, a much better world. And, and and they deserve to know, you know, and, and we don't often get that positive feedback and it's just so important. I'd be using every opportunity to give positive feedback. Okay. Uh, oh, Julie, this is a follow-up from what you were saying before. Um, so I love your more flexible model. It is not like learning contracts or clinical supervision. The mental role model is much more user-friendly. Excellent. Thanks for that feedback, Julie. Catherine's saying, my take-home message are the four questions to apply in a reflective mentoring relationship. Yeah, and remember those are my words. They're not the words you use, you hold them in your mind simply to frame up and, and, and generate a whole, and you probably already have, and it, it might be something you could brainstorm. You know, here's a, here's a task you could take to your support network. Take the four questions, split up into four groups, understand the concept first of all, and then brainstorm alternative words alternative questions that you might use, perhaps with a bit of a context. Okay, Marie's saying, I work with lots of your student nurses in the challenging roles in mental health. I think that's our student nurses. I really enjoy exploring new ways of mentoring students in this challenging area. I then in turn use some of the challenges I face in mentoring to take to my own mentoring session with my own mentors. Thank you for your insights tonight, Marie. You are very welcome and thanks for sharing. Okay, Janet saying I agree. Uh, Marie saying I agree with Cheryl. Cheryl sorry. Um, that's right, Cheryl. Thanks for mentoring me, says Jane. Um, thank you, Anne. I look forward to the next webinar. Can you please show the previous slide? Yes, I can. Let me go back. The quote, is that the one you're after? I suspect I love collecting quotes, so I'll leave that one up for a little while. Okay. Um, okay, that's Marion. Sarah is saying, what of my actions? Now, remember, it's really important that you have actions. You've invested your own time probably tonight. It's late in the evening now. I want you to make it worth your while. Uh, there's still 35 people on the line, so thanks for hanging in there. Do yourself a favour. Think about your actions. Write them down. Share them here if you want, but at least write them down for yourself because that's how you make this worthwhile. So Sarah's saying, one of my actions will be to, one, acknowledge my current mentor, I have just realised is a mentor and say thank you to her. How wonderful. I think I'm going to talk about, um, 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 I'll, I'll, uh, I, you've given me a topic for one of our webinars that I think is really important, uh, positivity and how we need you know, around five times the amount of positivity in our life um, to, to negativity. And I'm guessing you meet up with plenty of negativity in your work, in your life. You know, you've only got to turn on the TV um, screen to, to see the negativity that's out there. And you can counter that. And any time you say a heartfelt thank you to someone um, and tell them why, then you are boosting their positivity ratio so um so sarah is also saying but also to use those open-ended questions rather than trying to help solve other people's problems and issues in one go look it's a natural instinct and something you're trained you're trained to be problem solvers um answer givers but your takeaway here is ask the questions first. You can still give the answers and give the solutions, but it's so much more empowering if people can come to those conclusions if you um, if you can hold off for yourself. Uh, Terry, I do, yes, I do have a website, the Mentoring Works website. Um, flick me an email if you need something. Happy to uh, point you in the direction. How do we find a network if we don't have one already? Now, APNA is setting up peer-led networks. There are um, special interest groups within APNA um, in your local community. Uh, you, you may want a community of nurses. You may also benefit from other sorts of community. We already had someone who was talking about on Facebook they have a, a shared interest in mental health and they found like-minded people there. Um, 
you can set up closed groups or secret groups on Facebook. So you don't want every Tom, Dick and Harry seeing uh, your conversations there, but they can be quite powerful. There are other vehicles for you to set up networks online. Um, I think that will be that could be a discussion point for one of our other webinars as well, because all of the information you've provided in your questions and comments tonight will be sifting through. We've got one uh, webinar with content already planned, our next one. It's a follow-up to this one. But we've got two more which are open at the moment in terms of content. And likewise, if you've got suggestions or ideas or needs, send those in either to me or to uh, our APNA organisers who will be in touch with you regarding the um, recording of this webinar and uh, and we'll do our best to meet those needs. Get yourself along to conferences as well. Um, there are lots of activities uh, that APNA put on. We've got the annual conference coming up. Um, maybe you can get up to the Gold Coast, maybe not, but if you're booked for that, that's a great place to network and find people that you can connect with. Follow up those people that you meet, you exchange email addresses, maybe phone numbers, um, follow up on those quickly once you meet someone. When you go to a professional development activity, when you go to a course, these are the places where you establish contact with people um, and it can be a reciprocal mentoring relationship, it can be a buddy kind of relationship, it can be a friendship, it can be a professional friendship or colleagueship. But make the contact, reach out to that person soon after you meet them, establish the rapport, build the trust and you build the relationship and you can build it up into a network. Amanda, oh, I like this. Amanda is saying, I've just started a lean in circle for peer mentoring. First meeting next month. Going to use the four cues and elicit part of the mentoring dynamic. Oh, round of applause. For Amanda, I like that. I want to hear more about that, Amanda. And if you're willing to share that with the with the online group in the next webinar, love to hear some more about that. Okay, Cheryl. Uh, oh, this will be a key takeaway. Be assured that we don't have to have the answers for everything. You know, sometimes I tell mentors you don't have to have any answers. If you are a good listener, if you're really present, if you can ask questions, um, and don't be afraid to say it takes a lot of courage but it's a truthful answer if you say I don't know I wonder where we could find that out and collaboratively go looking for answers maybe there's another mentor the two of you can seek or the group can seek maybe there's some reference material you can source maybe you can reach out to your uh, to to APNA or your other networks and yeah, you don't have to have the answers. That's the old model, being the expert, being the font of all wisdom. Um, I'm tempted to quote our Prime Minister here. In fact, I think I will. You don't have to be the suppository of all wisdom. That's what he said. Um, leave politics out of it, but I thought it was a funny comment. Um, Carolyn's saying, I also like the idea of being a link rather than creating dependence, all about empowering nurses just like we do with our patients. Yes. So send your nurses off. If you know the answer is out there and they can find it, point them in the, in the direction. Ask them to go and get an answer and then to bring back what they find out and have a conversation with you about your experience and your opinion about what they find out. This is where mentors really value add. Don't become Google. Google's out there. You know, we have... Uh, all of the knowledge in the world in our pockets on our iPhones these days. We can find out almost anything if we know how to look. The value a human being adds to that is the conversation, the collaborative conversation, the discussion, the ideas, the input, the exchange around information. Information is not wisdom. Wisdom comes out of the sharing and the discovery and the conversation and the insight. 
wow, you're hanging in there. Still got 32 people on the line and I can't see an end to these questions and comments. I'm going to keep going as long as you want to hang around. Okay, Tracy says, key takeaway, like the idea of faceless online mentoring. <laughs> yeah, look, there's a reason I don't put my face on uh, my webcam on. I'm sitting here quite casually um, and I don't have any makeup on and it's late in the evening for me now. Um, I'm a morning person, not an evening person. You don't want to be looking at me right now. Um, and an e-mentoring, online mentoring is the evidence is in and it works really well. So make use of that. And it means too, you can reach out around the world. You know, there's, uh, I'm talking to nurses in Canada. I'm, uh, I've been to Canada to speak and I'm going to Canada again. There's terrific nurse networks over there. Um, I'm talking to the, can I pronounce it, um, Saskatchewan Polytechnic and we're setting up a network. You could reach out to them. Um, I remember doing some research and finding some fantastic online, online resources, some academic papers that were so useful, some, some, some um, articles, all sorts of things. And they've got authors and you can reach out and find them. Why not have an online mentoring relationship with someone on the other side of the world? You just have to get the time zones right. Um, but you can do that. How wonderful. Catherine is saying, thank you. My first webinar experience has been wonderful. I would be interested if the people enrolled in this web webinar are women. Um, Scrolling down, um, I, I suspect they are mostly, if not all, women. Um, but, you know, the, the boys can come along too. They've got plenty to offer and um, uh, a great point of view perhaps and, and, and some learning as well. Okay, Rosie is saying, I really think sometimes our busyness reflection I really think sometimes in our busyness, reflection is a high priority. It needs to be a high priority. We need to take time out. I think busyness is a curse and um, I think it's something we really need to look at. Busyness, are we really, are we really putting our high priorities as high priorities? Uh, take time out to, to reflect. Okay. Tracy is saying action. First, I have to cook tea. Oh, I had mine before I came online. I didn't want to be hungry and tired. Okay, so enjoy your dinner. Um, so you should. I wonder should you got someone else to cook it for you, given that you're working. Okay, uh, Marianne saying thank you for that. How true. Mentoring is so important to help us all go forward in this crazy world. Yeah, let's bring a bit more sanity. Amanda saying for next session, I would like more information about how. As the mentee, you can take advantage of mentoring moments. That's a good topic and, yeah, that's something nice I'd like to think about and maybe write about and we can talk about it. Okay, great. Catherine, person-centred mentoring. Yes. Rosie, thank you. Have to sign off as I've been off on duty since 7. Oh, my goodness, on duty since 7.30 a.m. Very tired but enjoyed tonight. Oh, good night, Rosie. Thanks for sticking with us so long. Cheryl has to go. Thanks, Anne. I will look forward to the next webinar. I think this might be the last one. If you've got something at your fingertips, type it in now. Um, thank you, Anne. I've enjoyed the webinar and look forward to the next one. I must go. Bye for now. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Terry. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Okay, um, I'm seeing people go home to uh, to their dinners and to their evenings. Okay, uh, good night, Marie. Oh, Marie's been up since 6.15 this morning. Uh, Janet, thank you and good night and good night to you too. Um, thanks, Anne. Uh, thank you and good night, Julie. Okay, I think it's time to call it a night. I'm stopping.